I. You're with Julian on the Brown Note and a of Unforgiven. So I mentioned I'm doing uh, Roundup because I've got a big 4K TV. I'm doing uh, a lot of uh, the more widescreen films of the last 30 years. I didn't mention in Casino, and I think it's the same with Unforgiven to a degree. You notice those benefits of having a 4K film a lot more with newer films. Um, if you've already got a high-definition version of uh, Casino or uh, Unforgiven, the benefits are possibly not vast enough to warrant going down that road but Unforgiven was an iconic film so um, Clint Eastwood has one of the most interesting careers in all of Hollywood history it's very much like the Leonardo DiCaprio character in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood he straddles eras so he was um, Rowdy Yates I think in um, Gunsmoke for about t 10 years maybe which was the you know the Leonardo DiCaprio character in that film which was a uh, old school uh white outfit on a mounted horse sort of cowboy era but then he got he would he, either by luck or and, and you see the dicaprio character in once upon a time in hollywood get seduced by al pacino's character a movie producer saying go and work in these spaghetti westerns and him saying i'm working in spaghetti westerns i don't want to do this but that's exactly what happened to Kenneth eastwood after he he left, um, I think it was Gunsmoke, but um, after he left this very well-established, very straight Western role, he suddenly goes into the full counterculture role of A Fistful of Dollars. And these films, which were huge hits for the public, A Few Dollars More, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, made him an international star. All were hits with the public, but none of them got good reviews when they came out. Even the music by Ennio Morricone never got a single awards nomination. And now we look back on them as three of the greatest films of all time. Um, so he made a very good choice. But no one saw him morphing into um, one of Hollywood's most esteemed directors. And he did that pretty much straight away. At the start of the 70s, he was Dirty Harry. Um, two iconic characters, a man with no name and, and Dirty Harry. But he directed, played Misty for me and The Outlaw Josie Wales. And these are films that have stood up as great films. Towards the end of the 70s, he really fell off, and again, not commercially, because um, Every Which Way But Loose and these really goofy sort of post-Burt Reynolds, good times, post-Smoking the Bandit, good time films, were huge hits, but um, didn't leave a lasting impact. And he did sort of taper off into the 80s, where you thought maybe you'd heard everything that you would need. Little did we know that he would have a renaissance that has, you know, he would end up winning Best Director at the Oscars twice. So we got Pale Rider, which was and often is, is acclaimed now as a film didn't get its just rewards when it came out. First time he'd gone back to doing a Western, and it is a good film. It is nothing like Unforgiven. Unforgiven came out in 92 and won, you know, Best Director, Best Picture. I think one of the biggest losses there was uh, the fact it didn't win in Best Actor because... I will remember this. I'll go through. Um, because I think it's the greatest performance of his career, and it's a performance that I only realised later. So we get <coughs> a revisionist Western, and virtually every Western since The Searchers in the 1950s has been a revisionist Western versus Stagecoach with John Wayne, where everyone's, you know, you've got Indians firing bows and arrows at noble cowboys no one ever really has gone back and watched those films everything that everyone talks about is a, a, a revisionist postmodern in some way western whether it's the Sergio Leone films or McCabe and Mrs Miller or you know all of those films have bent the outlaw purity story into horrible often horrible misshapes um, and there is no Western post the 1970s as good as Unforgiven. So over the last 40 years, it is undoubtedly the greatest. Um, we get a lot of meta sort of referencing to Clint Eastwood's entire career here, which is he plays the man with no name. The man with no name is from the Sergio Leone films and is a temperately good and evil guy who is usually on the wrong side of the law isn't full-blown evil but 
can very much be a murderous scumbag. But here we get the pure version of him, which is a guy that looks back on his past as being drunk every day and a horrible sociopathic murderer who's met a woman, settled down, given up drinking and spent years on a, an impoverished pig farm and has given up his evil ways. And he has moved on to being a very impoverished farmer. He is then greeted by... Uh, Jamie's Wolver as a Schofield kid who's this young brash guy who reckons he's a gunslinger just like the man with no name was who's called William Money here he reckons he's you know he wants William Money to accompany him on a mission and they'll split a thousand dollars a fortune in you know the late 1800s uh, and what's happened is what we see at the start of the film which is it's actually bookended with um, two views of William Money's farm uh, with a little bit of dialogue over the top of the screen saying, you know, how the woman, the wife of William Money had died and the mother had made the journey to her grave and could never understand why she would meet and marry a man of such notorious intemperate disposition and so on, which bookends the entire movie. But we see at the start in the opening sequence that the um, in a in a local pub, which is, of course, full of... Um, prostitutes um, we see one of them getting her face cut up horribly by a guy that she laughs at his appendage and he goes nuts and cuts her up um, played by uh, Anna Thompson Anna Thompson as Delilah and Francis Fisher Strawberry Alice who's like the madame who runs the brothel um, and they're you know they're incensed they want these guys these two cattle herders hung um, and then we get the Oscar winning uh, main performance from Gene Hackman as Sheriff Little Bill Daggett appears on the scene and ends up just rewarding the owner of the pub because the guy who owns the pub says he paid good money for her and we're going to get some horses off of these guys and you can have them uh, which makes the prostitutes quite incensed she, the, the woman gets nothing it goes from a hanging to we're not even going to whip them in the town square we're going to take some horses off of them because this is a contractual dispute and, and that's it. So the prostitutes all band together, put all their money together to hire a killer to come and kill these two cattle ranchers. And that's the setup for the film. So we get the Schofield kid trying to get William Money to come along with him to shoot these two guys dead and collect the $1,000. Along the way, they meet up, um, William Money refuses, but after his pigs are nearly all dead, he heads off with his compatriot from the old days, played by Morgan Freeman. The casting here is nuts. Um, and we find out with a sequence which Roger Ebert said was unnecessary to the screenplay and stopped it being perfect. I completely dispute this. We get an outstanding performance from Richard Harris's English Bob. He's the first gunslinger seeking to take the money. And he's a very important character. I don't know why Roger Ebert said that he wasn't because he didn't meet Clint Eastwood or Morgan Freeman in the story because he's got a biographer with him and the biographer is there to tell the story of the old west but it's all a lie and the English Bob character is shown by the fact that little Bob uh, little Bill Daggett the sheriff of the town actually knew him back in the old days so he tells this fabricated ludicrous version of his her heroism and gunslinging prowess but the Gene Hackman character just shoots him down in flames and it's like, you were absolute scum, you were drunk all the time, you were lucky whenever you killed someone. And it's these two conflicting views of the West which is at the heart of the movie. Um, and the fact that Little Bill drives him off so completely and brutally, I thought was essential to the story because it shows how dangerous he was. So the sheriff actually comes from the part of the country that William Money himself came from and actually was one of these villains at some point in his life. So we get this town, the 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 Eastwood character, the Morgan Freeman character and the Schofield kid arrive as a trio in this town and pretty much all hell breaks loose. Um, the screenplay here versus something like Casino is next to scene on scene perfect. Um, every character is so well cast here that they could have all won awards, but I really want to single out Clint Eastwood. 
it, I felt Clint Eastwood wasn't at his best in this film until the last third, when there is a moment from when he's talking to the Schofield kid who's just killed someone for the first time and he'd lied about doing it before and has decided that it isn't for him and he's broken completely and Eastwood is basically saying yeah it's a hell of a thing to kill a man and the prostitute arrives with their money and tells them that their friend's been killed by by the Gene Hackman character and that moment is one of the best in cinema it is incredible the way that he hears the story the prostitute's telling about his best friend being killed and picks up the whiskey bottle after a decade of sobriety and is drinking it and there and she's saying you know he said that you were william money murderer of women and children and so on and he becomes the devil incarnate and the next scene we see is the final one in the bar which is one of the greatest shootout scenes in history but the reason I think that he's so hard done by not to have won an Oscar for this performance is I felt that he was a bit cringe when he was doing the whole, you know, I'm not like that anymore routine. But it was actually watching Breaking Bad that made me completely change my opinion about this performance. And I felt that the first season of Breaking Bad, up until about the halfway point, I felt that he was a bit cringe, um, Brian Cranston, and that he was a bit cringe inducing with his family and their interactions. And it was all a bit too much. And the reason is, is because he never was that man. He always was Heisenberg in Breaking Bad. He always was the demon. He was pretending to be the family man. And it's the same with Clint Eastwood here. He's, he's a little bit clunky and cringe inducing when he's with his kids and when he's pretending to be something because he is this murderer. He is this avenging angel of death. That's who he naturally is. And he, him becoming that character late on in the movie is just one of the greatest sequences in any film. Um, I think this is a flat-out masterpiece. Every character is so well helmed and acted and written, and it's it's got such a complete hole in its narrative in what it tells. Um, and the darkness that arises at the end is, is almost like the fitting end to the Western. So an absolute masterpiece. So um, I think it's held, I've, God knows how many times I've watched it over the years, there's at least four awards-worthy performances. Even um, Francis Fisher's Strawberry Alice is awards-worthy in it as well. The cinematography is beautiful. The soundstage is really, really good with the, um, there's a lot of storm noise in it, which comes across really well, maybe in this high-definition era. Um, and the music as well from Lenny Nyhurst and the cinematography from Jack Green everything is incredibly classy but i think that overall it's just a perfect screenplay acted and cast to perfection so i'm going to give unforgiven a 10 out of 10 a 10 out of 10 for unforgiven and from the feature album by boy genius called the record this is not strong enough <laughs> 